Marvelous to hear the word of God sung. And let's give an amen to that. All of God's people said, Amen. Thank you, Brother Keith, and thank you, choir. We're enjoying it greatly. We like to take the opportunity, especially when we have visitors from the community, to share a brief word from the scriptures concerning God's plan of salvation. What is the gospel? How is it that someone can be saved and know for sure that they're on their way to heaven? The Apostle Paul explains the gospel to us in 1 Corinthians 15, the opening few verses of that chapter, a very important chapter as we look into the scriptures. It gives to us succinctly, in a nutshell, what the gospel is. The gospel is not what you can do. The gospel is what God has done. The good news is that you don't save yourself. The good news is that Christ provides salvation. And Paul explains that in these opening verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in mind what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes on and gives the proof for what he has just set forth in those first four verses. Those who were witnesses, those who were bearing testimony, the fact that this is in harmony with what the Old Testament Word of God had proclaimed. It's a simple message, who Jesus is, what Jesus did. The person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I many, remember many years ago working at a, uh, a witnessing pavilion at one of the world's fairs. I was in charge of about 140 young people and sharing the gospel with all those who were going about the fairgrounds. One day a young military man came to our pavilion and uh, I had the privilege of speaking with him for a few moments because he wanted to become one of these hosts and hostesses that invited folks to come in to our pavilion. So I said to him, Ned, I said, what do you believe the gospel is? What must a person do to be saved? Well, he went through a humongous litany of all the different things that he had heard. Helping little old ladies across the street, fixing your neighbor's bathtub. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't imagine all the different things that he thought might be necessary for getting into heaven. We shared this passage of scripture with him. The gospel focuses on Jesus, not on you. The gospel focuses on God and his provision not on your personal striving. The gospel focuses on the fact that God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son into this world and he became a man so that he might die on Calvary's cross and pay for our sins. Paul explains it also in Romans chapter 1, the first four verses as well. And the thing that's stands out is very striking about both of these passages of scripture is that it focuses on the scripture. It's according to the scriptures. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians or Romans, most of the New Testament had not yet been written. When he spoke of the scriptures, he was talking about that Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament. And as we look through the pages of the Old Testament scripture, we discover that there was the promise of one who would come, one who would be sinless, one who would be virgin born, one who would be a substitutionary sacrifice, one who would fulfill all the typology of the Old Testament, one who would be the Lamb of God. As we look here, we see Paul synthesizing these things, bringing them down together, and telling us about the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, here is the gospel. 
I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. This was not something new that Paul was making up. This was something that was well grounded in the apostolic tradition. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was not merely a moral influence. He was not merely a good example. He was not merely a martyr, but one who died for our sins. The issue with which all of us have to deal is the issue of sin. Sin separates you from God. There is a holy God who rules the universe. There is a God who cannot tolerate sin. There is a God who judges sin. When you speak to people of Christ, you must help them to understand, and they well do, though they do not want to admit it, that they are sinners. Dear friends, all of us in this room are sinners. If you were not a sinner, you would not need a Savior. If you do not need a Savior, Jesus Christ is irrelevant. But the Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There may be someone here tonight, I do not know your soul, but someone who is not on the road to heaven, someone who is plummeting head first into hell. The first thing you need to understand is that you are not a good person. None of us are. The first thing you need to understand is that you are a sinner in the sight of a holy God. When we understand our position, then we understand our need. When we understand our depravity, then we understand that there is an opportunity which God has provided to cleanse us from sin. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. When you look at the Old Testament scriptures, you discover that this one who is the Christ, the Christos, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Anointed One, there would be some things about him that were unique and distinct from all other beings. He must indeed be God. If he is not God, he cannot give you eternal salvation. If he is merely a creature, even an exalted creature, such as Michael the Archangel, which the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, then he cannot give you eternal life, for he has a life that must be sustained from outside. He is not one who can save you, he is merely another creature like you. The one of the Old Testament, of whom Micah, chapter 5, verse 2 speaks, is the one who was spoken of when Herod called his scribes to him and said, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? These men are here from the east, and, and they claim to have seen his star, and they claim he's a king, and Herod was paranoid about anyone who claimed to be king. So he wanted to know, what are the prophecies? And they said, he's to be born in Bethlehem of Judah. But they didn't quote the last part of that verse. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This one who was to be born in Bethlehem was one who was eternal and had always existed. He was going to be the eternal God come down to earth in human flesh. He has to be God in order to save you. But he must also be man, that he might fulfill the righteous justice of God and pay for sin with his own blood. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us, there is no remission. God set that standard long ago. All the way back to the days of Cain and Abel where God provided 
a lamb that Cain rejected. Abel brought the bleeding sacrifice and was accepted. And all the way through the Old Testament system, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sheep and bulls and goats that were slain. It described what the New Testament calls the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. 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 The And then one came who was the perfect Lamb of God. One came who was sinless, who did not need to pay for his own sins, but one who was infinite. Were he only finite, he could only pay for his own sins. He had to be both infinite and he had to be sinless man to shed blood. That's the Christ of Scripture. And so we're told about his person, who he is, both God and man. One person, two natures. And then we're told what he did, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and was buried. That's the proof that he was really dead. It wasn't the swoon theory of Hugh Schoenfield. It wasn't a phantasm that they saw coming back. He was dead and was buried. But then it tells us he rose the third day, which was also according to the scriptures. David prophesied, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, proving that God's promise of eternal life is true. He didn't make promises that then he did not follow through on. He made a promise based upon his death and resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is central to Christian faith. That's what the whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is about. Now I go through that. It's simple. Who Jesus is, both God and man. What Jesus did, he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. And the scripture says, if you will place your faith in him alone, nothing that you do, nothing that you bring, merely trusting him for what he has done, God will give you eternal life. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Tomorrow may not come. If you have never personally trusted in Jesus Christ alone to give you eternal life, you are lost. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ and his finished work at Calvary and his resurrection from the dead, if you've never trusted the Christ of Scripture, you are lost. If you have any other Jesus, if you have any other Christ of your own making or of some other religion, you are lost. Only the Christ of Scripture can save you if you've never trusted him. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is your opportunity to trust him alone. For he alone can give you eternal life. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the simplicity of the gospel that even a child can understand and believe. And Father, we pray that you will take your word, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.